The defiance of Duskendale that spanned most of the year 277 AC may have been consigned to the dusty pages of history as an interesting event if it was not for one thing. The sheer impact it had on King Eris II and how it influenced how the events over the next decade would transpire and accumulate into the downfall of House Targaryen. His six month captivity at the Dunfort at the hands of Lord Denis Darklin had shattered the little sanity that Eris Targaryen still possessed. From then on, the king's madness became unchecked, growing worse with every passing year. It was clear that there was none of the young, promising king who had ascended the Iron Throne all those years ago. The Darklands had dared to lay their hands upon the blood of the dragon, manhandling him, stripping him of his royal finery, and even daring to beat him. After Sir Barristan the Bold daring rescue, King Eris would no longer allow himself to be touched by anyone, not even his own servants. Therefore, his hair and beard were left uncut, and unwashed, his hair grew even longer and more tangled as it started to mat. His fingernails grew long and thickened into horrible yellow talons. Eris forbade any blade in his presence, with the exception of those carried by the sworn brothers of the Kingsguard. But most of all, Eris's judgment and punishments became even harsher and crueler than they were before. It took several long weeks to return Eris to King's Landing, given his condition. But once he did, he refused to leave the Red Keep for any reason and became a virtual prisoner in his castle for the next four years during which time his madness only deepened and he distrusted those around him even more. Most of all his hand, Tywin Lannister. He even had suspicions of his eldest son and heir, Prince Rhaegar, who he was convinced had conspired with Tywin to have him slain at Duskendale, that they had planned to storm the town wall so Lord Darkland would put the king to death, thus opening the way for Rhaegar to claim the Iron Throne and marry Lord Tywin's daughter, Cersei. He was sure it was only Barristan the Bold's heroic intervention that prevented this. Hoping to prevent supposed plotting like this from ever happening again, King Aerys turned to another of his childhood friends, summoning Lord Stephen Baratheon, Lord of Storm's End to court, and naming him to his spawn council. The reality is Stefan had heard the tales of Aerys's growing madness and knew not to take the king's word at his worth. It also appears that Lord Stefan and Tywin, whom were also friends, aligned when it came to many matters. In the year 278 AC, the king sent Lord Stefan across the narrow sea to the city of Valantis to find a suitable bride for his son and heir, Prince Rhaegar. Not wishing a Westerosi bride, fearing they could not be trusted, he wanted Stefan to find a maid of noble birth and of an old Valyrian bloodline. This job would normally be entrusted to the Hand, so Aerys giving it to Lord Stefan speaks to how little he now trusted Tywin. The very fact Prince Rhaegar had no involvement in the matchmaking process also speaks volumes. There were some rumours from this time that suggested that Aerys planned to name Stefan the Hand of the King if he succeeded in his mission, removing Tywin for office and arresting him for high treason. There were many wishing to gain Aerys' favour, who supported this idea and may have pushed him in that direction. Like with much of Targaryen history, there was to be a twist of fate as the gods clearly had other notions. Stephen Baratheon's mission ended in failure, not managing to find a bride who matched the king's list of requirements. On the voyage home from Volantis, his ship was caught in a storm and sank in the waters of Shipbreaker Bay in the sight of Storm's End and Stephen's young sons, Robert, Stannis and Renly, who looked on helpless. Both Stefan, his wife, and the whole crew of the ship were killed. One did survive, however. A fool Stefan had brought back from Volantis for his children. He was found washed up on a nearby beach, but it is said the trauma of the event broke the fool's mind, causing him to forever speak in riddles. When the word of the tragedy reached King's Landing, Aerys flew into a blind rage and had somehow come to the conclusion that Tywin Lannister had learned of Aerys' plans to name Stefan Hand and arranged for his murder. He told Grandmaster Pycelle, if I dismiss him as Hand, he will have me killed too. Could Tywin have really caused the death of Stefan? No. It's unlikely given the nature of Shipbreaker Bay. It's even fair to question if Tywin, a man of whom loyalty is a paramount trait, would have even wanted to murder his own friend. In the years that followed, the king's madness deepened. Though Tywin Lannister continued his hand, King Aerys no longer met with him, save in the presence of all seven of the King's Guard. Convinced that the small folk and lords were plotting against his life, and fearing that even Queen Rhaella and Prince Rhaegar might be part of these plots, he reached across the narrow sea 
to the free city of Pentos and imported a eunuch, only known as Varys, to serve as a spymaster. Aerys' logic was that only a man without friends, family or ties to Westeros could be trusted. Varys soon became known as the Spider by the small folk of Westeros and used the crown's gold to set up a vast web of informants that the realm had never seen before. For the rest of Aerys' reign, Varys would always be seen crouch at the king's side, whispering into his ear. In the wake of Duskendale, the king also began to display signs of ever-increasing obsession with wildfire, similar to that which had haunted several of his forebearers, most notably Arian Brightflame, who had drunk wildfire thinking it might turn him into a living dragon. Lord Darklin would never have to dare to defy him if he had been a dragon rider, Aerys reasoned. His attempts to bring forth dragons from eggs found in the depths of Dragonstone, some so old they had turned to stone, yielded naught but frustration. Aerys turned to the wisdom of the ancient guild of alchemists, who knew the secret of producing the volatile jade green substance known as wildfire, said to be a close cousin to Dragonflame. The pyromancers became a regular fixture at court as the king's fascination with wildfire grew. By 280 AC, King Aerys II had taken to burning traitors, murderers and plotters rather than hanging them or beheading them. The king seemed to take great pleasure in these fiery executions which were presided over by Wisdom Rizat, the Grand Master of the Guild of Alchemists.